made a video yesterday about how the gospel has gone out into all lands already by the time of St. Paul. And you guys are like, what? Huh? How? What? This doesn't help. This is more confusing. So let's go uh, take it slow. Um, the, the main point of the video is that there's a particular argument. So this is the basic question. Are there more promises to be fulfilled by in the scriptures than the second coming of Jesus? And the dispensationalists love to say, yeah, there's a lot of promises that simply weren't fulfilled uh, in, in the scriptures or in history, and so we're waiting for those promises to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back. They, they have like a checklist of all these things that haven't happened, and they say, see, these, these haven't happened yet, therefore they have to happen first. There has to be the abomination of desolation and all this other stuff. And the problem is they look for, they see the promise in the Bible, but they look for the fulfillment in history. So just as a couple of examples, they say, look, God promised to the people of Israel in Exodus 23 that they would possess the land all the way to the river Euphrates. And they say that never happened. They never had the land. But if you look in Joshua 21, 43, and like five other verses in Joshua, it says that God gave them all the land that he promised them. In other words, the Bible says that the, that the promise has been fulfilled. And if the Bible says it's been fulfilled, then we have to count it as fulfilled. In fact, there's this little verse in the time of King David where he says he reconquered the land to the all the way to the river. So they had it and lost it, and then they got it again. And if our history doesn't match up to that, then we just have to let the Scripture interpret Scripture. Another example, Samuel, 2 Samuel 7, 16 says that we... Uh, what? That we... Oh, yeah, that the, the uh, Messiah will sit on the throne of David. And... The dispensational says, look, that never happened. Jesus never sat on the throne. Even though Peter, in, in his Pentecost sermon, says that it did happen and that, that David prophesied it. When, when David said, uh, the, when he prophesied the ascension of Jesus, that that fulfilled the condition that the Messiah was going to sit on the throne. Now, how about that? So we have the promise and the fulfillment in the scripture. And if our history, if our understanding of history is wrong, then we don't understand either the promise or or the history. Now, the same thing then is true with the all nations promise. Jesus promises that the gospel will be preached in ev to every nation, and the dispensationalist says that hasn't happened yet, therefore Jesus can't come back. And we say, no, no, wait a minute. Look at these Bible passages that Pastor Wolf Miller was reading yesterday. Romans 10, 18, Colossians 1, 6, and Colossians 1, 23. These say that the gospel has gone into all nations. So the scripture interprets the scripture, and the promise is, is taught to us as being fulfilled. If we don't understand the fulfillment of the promise, then we don't understand the promise or we don't understand the fulfillment. Now, what's the point? The first point is this. There's an irony. The dispensationalists, our friends the dispensationalists are always telling us that they take the Bible literally. Um, that's the first point. But the second point is we have to, and this is the main theological point, is that to maintain the imminence of the return of Jesus, we have to state that all the promises have been fulfilled already. And the scripture gives us this pattern over and over so that the thing is true, that the, in Christ, all the promises of God are yes and amen in him. Okay. Now, to take a couple of kind of thoughts on this Matthew 24 text where Jesus is talking about the gospel being preached to all the nations. It's under the section that I like to call the not signs. Jesus says, basically, he gives three conditions and he says, this is how it's going to be. He says, all these things are going to happen and the end is not yet. So that these things that he's listing are not signs of the end, but rather just indications of how things are going to be. Nation will rise against nation. They will drag you in and they will persecute you. And that church will preach the gospel unto all the world. So these kind of three relationships are definitional of the time of the kingdom. This is just how things are going to go. Nation's going to fight against nation. Nation's going to fight against the church. And the church is going to bless the nations by the preaching of the gospel. So that's what Jesus is talking about. But then we have the question, well, how? I mean, how is this thing true? How was the gospel preached to all nations? Again, we have a couple of... How? We have a couple of options. One is it's an interpretation thing. That when we look at the words of Jesus, the promise of Jesus, and the fulfillment taught by Paul, that when, he's, when Jesus says the gospel will be preached in every nation, what he indicates, for example, is in all of the Roman Empire or something like that. 
In other words, it could be that we don't understand the promise on the fulfillment right. The other option, though, is the simply historical thing. We just don't know the history. And I think I want to I want to kind of lean in on this because one of the problems is that we our understanding of history is really shaped by someone tried to call our understanding of history. How do I make it? Yeah. Focus on the history part. Our understanding of history, if you're focusing on the cards, you won't notice that I didn't shave. I just ruined that. Our understanding of history is, uh, is so shaped by evolution that when we think of the ancient world, we think of people, We, I mean, we think of like little barely talking monkeys kind of running around, that the, that the ancient world was so, so um, diminished and so... Uh, you know, people could barely talk, that they could barely travel, that they lived in these mud huts, that they were, you know, they were sitting there just eating buffalo dung to make lives work and everything else like this. And so we have this really reductionistic view of, of history and the ancient world. Uh, it, there is a sense that cultures devolve, I think, when we understand history biblically. And it's like the further people went from Jerusalem the more their culture became basic. So you have all these great cities that are around the middle of the world, and the farther you get from that, the, the, the kind of more humble the situation gets. So by the time you get to the edge of the very southern Africa, people are living in caves. Now they would have never, like Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, they lived in cities, but the farther you get from the center, center of things, the more kind of basic and primitive they get. But that's a devolution, not an evolution. But we, we have this sort of, overarching understanding of primitiveness in the ancient world. And I'm not sure that's particularly helpful. It seems like there was more travel that was happening in the ancient world than we ever could imagine. I mean, even to think of the, like the time of Jonah, that he was sailing from one side of the Mediterranean to the other. And we have all this sort of evidence of the Vikings and stuff being part, discovering parts of, of the, the new world. In fact, uh, the, at some point, the people had to be able to travel from one place to everywhere else because there's people everywhere. They're, they they just they traveled around. So it could be that our understanding of history has been sort of overwhelmed by this evolutionary sense of the world so that we, we really think that people, the ancient people, were much more disconnected than they actually were, that there was communication happening all around. Now, is it true then that there was communication between, for example, Europe and the Americas? I don't know if we if we have proof of that, but I don't know if we should necessarily assume that we don't have proof of that. But this leads, uh, and and so so maybe our understanding of history isn't uh, isn't good enough. I mean, maybe there was ways that people travel. Now again, I don't know. I don't know if that's the case or not. Uh, I don't I don't have any evidence of it, but I do know that oftentimes we miss history because our minds are so kind of swamped in the evolutionary bog. Now, back to the point, though, if the Bible gives a promise and says that it's fulfilled and we don't and we don't understand how it could be fulfilled, then maybe we don't understand the promise. Maybe we don't understand the history. But the problem is us. And we don't want to say, well, the promise still hasn't been fulfilled. But this leads to this question about what about those who have never heard? And we we want to we want to say that at some point, every people's every nation has heard the gospel. And while we might not know how it was happening in the time of Paul, we do know that it goes back at least to Noah. Remember, we're all related. And Noah knew the gospel. He knew the righteousness of the gospel. So that there was a preaching of the gospel that was at the beginning of every tribe and people and nation in the world. Now, a couple of very interesting things about this fact. I was looking at the book of Concord, and our Phil friend Philip Melanchthon was talking, about, uh, was talking about this idea, the idea of sacrifice. And he says, the idea of victimhood and sacrifice is more easily understood from pagan customs. These were adopted from the misunderstanding of statements by the fathers. The Latins called a victim a piaculum, which was offered to reconcile God's anger in great calamities, where he seemed to be especially enraged. Sometimes they sacrificed human victims, perhaps 
because they had heard that a human victim would reconcile God for the entire human race. The Greeks sometimes called them cleansing, kathar, katharmata, and sometimes wiping away, perismata. Isaiah and Paul, therefore, mean that Christ became a victim, that is, a remedy, that by his merits and not by our own, God might be reconciled. Now, this is an amazing little statement. It's in the Apology to the Augsburg Confession 2423. And Melanchthon is saying that the pagan customs, like the Latin customs and the Greek customs, are misunderstanding of the preaching of the of the fathers, of the prophets, of Abraham, of Noah, and so forth. And he says that they even offered sometimes these sacrifices and these victims because they heard that a human victim would take away the sin of the world, and so they were offering their own victims. In other words, the pagan sacrifices of animals and even of, of people is a perversion of the gospel. Now, it's very interesting for me to know that, especially in South America and Central America, we found evidence of these pagan sacrifices offering human victims to the false gods and to the idols. And I think this might be true, that that, that shows not kind of the, the wickedness of the human heart, but the preaching of the gospel perverted by the wickedness of the human heart, that it indicates a misunderstanding of the gospel that was known to those people all at once. Now, one other thing on this, and again, we're in speculative territory here, so let it be fully known that we're speculating, and I'm, I've am i told you before, I don't know how the gospel has gone into all the world. That still stands true, but it seems like more and more as missionaries would go to places that had been unreached, that the conversation had broken off from the rest of the world, and they would bring the gospel to those places, a lot of times the people in those places would say, ah, that's the name, that's the history, that's the full doctrine, but they had an echo of the gospel that had been carried on in that particular place for, from generation to generation. And we have to say, when we look at the history of the world as taught through the scriptures, that that is an entirely true possibility. So, back to the question. How is it that the gospel has been preached to all nations at the time of, of, uh, of St. Paul? The answer is, I don't know. I mean, but the ignorance is my fault, and the ignorance is our fault for history. But if the Lord says that it's true, then we have to say, yeah, that promise is true, and we're not waiting for the fulfillment. I, ho I hope that clears it up. I think I've said as much as I know how to say without saying more than we can say, and, uh, I, and I hope that's helpful for you. You guys will let me know down below, though. Thanks, uh, thanks for the conversation and for the, uh, and for the comments. I'm really glad that you guys let me know that that last thing was not um, particularly clear and hopefully this uh, clears up a little bit the water uh, that will be muddy no matter what. Thanks. God's peace be with you.